Hey everyone, it's Dr. Antonucci from the Carrick Institute, and we've been getting a lot of requests from different scholars in our Functional Neurology Management of Concussion program to talk a little bit about the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine's new diagnostic criteria for concussion, as well as the SCAT-6 that was created by the Concussion and Sports Group at the most recent Amsterdam Concussion Consensus. So I put together a little recording for you guys uh, so that you can be up to date on everything. Remember, FM Mach was pretty much all based upon uh, SCAT-5 and the 1993 ACRM diagnostic criteria. So 30-year-old diagnostic criteria and, and having to pick a diagnostic criteria out of all of the ones out there, the ACRMs made the most sense to me. So that's what I chose to incorporate in this program. And we just got lucky that 30 years later, uh, towards the end of creating the Functional Neurology Management of Concussion Program, the ACRM released their most recent diagnostic criteria update, and they nailed it, in my opinion. It's spot on. So um, luckily, we don't have to do much backtracking. They just they didn't change a whole lot. They just added to it. So uh, we'll take a little time, go through it, and hopefully... Uh, this helps you in your practice and your understanding of concussion. So without any further ado, uh, we're going to be talking about diagnosing acute concussion in adults, okay? The reason why I say adults is because there's a child SCAT-6 and also the ACRM's diagnostic criteria, uh, they reference the can uh, Canadian CT head rule for adults, but the PCARIN for children. So there's a little bit of a different... Uh, criteria for children, both from the American Congress for Rehabilitation Medicine, as well as the Sports Concussion Assessment Tool. Uh, they have a child's version of it. So we're not going to cover either of those in this video, but we'll come back to that at a later time. Okay, so let's get going. So redefining concussion. So the concussion and sports group combined efforts with the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine to spearhead the definition of diagnostic criteria uh, for concussion and mild traumatic brain injuries. So back in October of 2022, Dr. Carrick and I attended the concussion and sports group event in Amsterdam, and they were talking all about this. And this is where I developed a lot of confidence in the program that we developed for you guys with the diagnostic criteria. But um, they hadn't released the guidelines yet, so it was still a little bit iffy, a little gray area what they were actually going to publish in that guideline. But what they did say at the Concussion and Sport Group meeting is that they are embracing and working with the ACRM uh, to combine efforts to define concussion, define sports concussion, mild traumatic brain injury, and create criteria uh, for diagnosing it that are not just clinical-based, but are uh, patho uh, pathology-based diagnostic criteria, everything from fluid biomarkers, so on and so forth. So those are the things that we're going to be incorporating into both uh, the ACRM and the Concussion and Sports Group def definition and diagnostic criteria of concussion. So from this point forward, I'm just going to refer to the ACRM and the concussion and sport group as one entity. So we'll just be talking about the diagnostic criteria and the um, definitions of concussion. Uh, and we're just understanding that's coming from both of those groups. And honestly, there's a lot of overlap between the two groups, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, concussion and sports group. Um, they, they both have Grant Iverson involved with it, uh, with both of them. Uh, Nova, Noah's involved with both of them. So. Anyways, lots of people are in both groups, so there is a lot of interdigitation um, and a lot of reciprocity, if you will, going back and forth between the two, so we have a more coherent <clears throat> and uniform definition. Remember, the concussion and sports group, their, their focus is 100% concussion in sports. And fortunately or unfortunately, that's where all of the big research is. When you get athletes together, whether it's high school, uh, military, uh, well, I guess military is not really sports, but uh, university level athletics. <clears throat> these are all people that are clustered together. That's why I kind of said military included that in there. These are congregations of people that become pretty easy to evaluate and assess when they have a concussion for baselines, afterwards, follow-ups. And there's also something hanging over their head. You're not going back to play until you get reevaluated. So we get these longitudinal data points on these groups a little bit better than we get uh, people that slip and fall on ice or get into car accidents or 
uh, domestic abuse, so on and so forth. So that's why the concussion sports group started focusing mainly on sports, but they acknowledge that the pathophysiology applies to most, if not all, concussions and mild traumatic brain injuries. And we're going to talk about the difference between concussion and mild traumatic brain injury in this video as well, too. So here's the preamble that the concussion and sports group wrote to the ACRM definition. And their goal in this preamble was to pretty much lay the groundwork for what a sports concussion is um, and the criteria associated with it. So they said a concussion is a traumatic brain injury caused by a direct blow to the head, neck, or elsewhere on the body, resulting in an impulsive force being transmitted to the brain. Perfect first sentence. Um, if it is a traumatic brain injury. People get caught up as, well, a concussion is not a traumatic brain injury and, and you know, concussions are, are a traumatic brain injury. Or, you know, for a while there, we even called concussions and mild traumatic brain injuries almost different things. The, the mild traumatic brain injuries were civilians and military concussions were, were reserved for sports. So at this point, we're saying a concussion is a traumatic brain injury and it could be caused by a blow to the head. And then the important stuff comes after this because everybody knows it can be caused by a blow to the head, but neck or elsewhere on the body resulting in an impulsive force being transmitted to the brain. So I've told this story a couple times, uh, and, and this is going to be a repeat for some of you who've taken some of the refresher courses, the concussion boot camps that we've offered, because I've incorporated all this material into those because that concussion boot camp is supposed to be the most up-to-date, ongoing, uh, evolving uh, sort of program. But I wanted to make sure those of you who are taking FN Mach level one particularly can have the opportunity to stay current as things change. So that's why I recorded this video. But some of you have already taken concussion boot camp. You've kind of heard this, but I grew up in the Northeast, like Connecticut area. We had a house in Vermont, wood floors, and my mom loved her Murphy's oil soap. She would scrub the floors and they would become so shiny and slippery and glossy. And we used to put our warm, fuzzy socks on in the wintertime. And my brother and I used to run down the hallway and, and just slide down the hallway on our feet. Well, we also had hardwood stairs. So sometimes when you're wearing your warm, fuzzy socks on the Murphy oil soaped hardwood floors going down the stairs, you lose your footing and you fall on your backside. You don't have to hit your head. I've seen so many patients that have slipped and fall on, fell on stairs, never hit their head and have pretty bad concussions uh, depending on the fall, right? Depending on that impulsive force on how great of a magnitude it was. So you can understand now this is a really big thing because it says you don't have to hit your head. Um, and because sometimes, uh, especially in litigation, uh, the opposing counsel is always trying to prove that you didn't hit your head. So you can't have a traumatic brain injury. Um, and now this just kind of lays that out there saying that they're defining this as a tra brain trauma caused by direct blow to the head, neck, or elsewhere in the body resulting in an impulsive force transmitted to the brain. And the next part is a little bit more about the pathophysiology. It initiates a neurotransmitter and metabolic cascade with possible axonal injury, blood flow changes, and inflammation affecting the brain. So it's not always guaranteed. There's always a neurotransmitter and metabolic cascade, but there's possible axonal injury, blood flow changes, and inflammation affecting the brain. And the next bullet point is super important as well too. Signs and symptoms may be present immediately or evolve over minutes to hours. And when it says hours, it could be 72 hours, right? It could be three days. It doesn't have to be one, two, three, four, five hours. This is why we always say when in doubt, pull them out, right? Because the reality is, is somebody can feel completely uh, perfect, completely fine for hours, days, and all of a sudden, the headaches come on, the, the pulsatile headaches, the postural dysautonomia, the blurred vision, the dizziness, the migraineous, the migraineous sort of scenario, nausea, things of that nature. Uh, it can come on after days. So 72 hours is the cutoff that we're really looking at for the pathophysiology and the symptoms to catch up with each other up to 72 hours, but they commonly resolve within days, but may be prolonged. In the uh, Amsterdam concussion consensus paper, they came to an agreement that 
by definition, uh, concussion symptoms lasting than f greater than four weeks are going to be called persisting post-concussive symptoms, all right? So, and they are kind of moving away from the word syndrome because a syndrome is a well-defined cluster of signs and symptoms, like metabolic syndrome, right? Um, that's pretty well defined, you know, waist girth and body mass index and blood glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides, things of that nature. That gives you your metabolic syndrome. Um, however, and that's homogeneous. However, we know that concussion is so heterogeneous. So it's kind of hard to call something a post-concussive syndrome if it's different in every single person. So persisting post-concussive symptoms are from four weeks and on, so 28 days and on, or most people will just say 30 days and on. This next one, they're all important, but the next one is super important. No abnormality is seen on st standard structural imaging with concussion. I'll let that sink in for a second there. So CT scans and MRIs, whether it's T1, T2 weighted images, must be normal in order to diagnose concussion. But there might be changes on functional uh, imaging, such as blood flow imaging or metabolic imaging studies. Uh, but CT scans, MRIs will be negative in concussion by definition now. So to kind of hit this point home, they say the term concussion may be used in a mild traumatic brain injury when neuroimaging is either normal or not clinically indicated. Okay, so it doesn't mean you have to have imaging every time you hit your head or have a suspected concussion, there's gonna be a criteria that we follow whether to f figure out whether we order imaging or not. However, if we go through that criteria and they don't meet the criteria, imaging is not warranted, um, then they can have a concussion. Or if the imaging that, they, that was warranted was normal, they can have a concussion. However, let's talk about the flip side of the coin. When neuroimaging is performed and if a trauma-related intracranial abnormality is found, the injury would be considered at minimum a mild traumatic brain injury and not a concussion. So you can kind of see there's a line drawn in the sand at this most recent uh, concussion consensus in Amsterdam. It's concussion on one side of the line, mild traumatic brain injury on the other side of the line. It's not to say that concussion is not a mild traumatic brain injury, but we're kind of segregating them into two separate diagnostic conditions. One of them has no imaging findings or no imaging warranted. The other one has positive imaging findings, okay? And it says at minimum, a mild traumatic brain injury because it could be moderate, it could be severe with the brain imaging abnormalities. So take that one to the bank, make sure you educate people on this that just because their imaging was negative doesn't mean they don't have a concussion. And if the imaging was positive, you need to make sure that you understand and your patient understands they did not have a concussion. They had a traumatic brain injury of a certain degree in which you don't know unless you kind of go through some of the steps that we're gonna talk about today. Okay, so hopefully that's nice and clear. I think this is an important, important slide. Now, as far as the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine goes, there's the paper where it was published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Uh, Noah Silverberg, as I kind of mentioned earlier, was the lead author on this. Grant Iverson was also involved with it. Um, Nate Zasler, uh, Roger Zemek was the PI on the paper. Uh, so a lot of really um, tight, big titans in the world of concussion involved in this work, John Letty, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of great minds contributed to this. And what they came up with is uh, the criteria is made up of six criterion, right? So obviously criteria is plural, criterion is singular. So criterion one is a mechanism of injury. So the mechanism of injury must be plausible. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But essentially what we're saying is that if somebody throws a paper ball at your head, you didn't have a concussion. There's no possible way. That's not plausible to cause a concussion unless maybe there was a, I don't know, a lead ball in the middle of it wrapped in paper or something like that. But I mean, even like Roger Clemens, Nolan Ryan, some of the fastest pitchers 
ever existed in Major League Baseball, throwing a paper ball as hard as they could, could not give somebody a concussion because there's not enough mass times acceleration to create the force uh, that would cause a concussion. So criterion one says there must be a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury. Criterion two says there needs to be one or more clinical signs. Criterion three says two or more acute symptoms. Criterion four is associated clinical and laboratory findings. People get tripped up on laboratory. They think that you need to draw blood or something like that. Think of your clinic as your laboratory. It's where you do all of your investigations, where you put people through testing and, and investigate. That's the best way to say it. It's a laboratory for you. That is your laboratory. So laboratory findings are synonymous with clinical findings because it's something you're ascertaining, but to just say clinical findings kind of narrows us and, and basically eliminates fluid biomarkers, things like uh, serum or saliva uh, from being used in the criterion. So they were thinking ahead on this with the micro RNAs technology coming out, uh, with some of the saliva technologies coming out, um, to be able to include these things in the criteria for diagnosing concussion. And we'll talk about how these criteria interact with each other in just a moment as well too. Criterion five is neuroimaging. It's not required, but if it's present um, or there's pathology present, it comes into play. And then criterion six is also really important. Criterion six that says that criterion two, three, and four cannot be better explained by a comorbidity, something existed you know, at the same time or before, another diagnosis, schizophrenia, bipolar, whatever it might be, a drug or alcohol. Because if you think about it, if you, um, if you take someone and you didn't see them have a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury and they walk up to you stumbling and slurring and kind of going in and out of consciousness, you would say, oh my goodness, they've got clinical signs, they can't walk, they've got laboratory findings, symptoms, they're nauseous and dizzy. Oh my gosh, they had a concussion. But that would be much better explained by the, you know, shots of Geneva or whatever that they did at the bar before they came to your office. Okay. So criterion six says that um, something else can't better explain criterions two, three, and four. You can kind of see that this is a bit complex. We're going to walk through it. And by the time we're done with it, you should be very fluent in this because I've done it so many times and everybody that goes through it always ends up getting it. You might just have to watch it a couple times, but that's why you have this recorded. So here's the flow chart associated with this 2023 ACRM mild traumatic brain injury diagnostic criteria. And the M is in parentheses because realistically, this is a traumatic brain injury diagnostic criteria. We're gonna figure out if it's mild or not, or a concussion. So starting at the top, working our way down, criterion one is the biomechanical plausible mechanism of injury. If you don't meet the threshold for criterion one, you don't go any farther. Um, you cannot have a traumatic brain injury, a concussion, things like that. And that's why some of these individuals talking about uh, chemical concussions, it just doesn't make any sense because they're basically saying, oh, you, you have exposure to different chemicals, but you're dizzy and lightheaded and have orthostatic hypotension. So you, you have a chemical concussion. By definition, I mean, concussion basically comes from the Greek word to shake. Um, so if we don't have that biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury, we cannot call it a concussion. Okay, so taking a look at that criterion one, there's black and there's white. This is where things get real easy, right? Paper ball at somebody's head, very white, no possible way that can cause a concussion. On the flip side of it, somebody gets ejected from a vehicle going 55 miles per hour, lands headfirst into a tree, um, is unconscious, can't move, very black. That person had a brain injury, right? So it's the gray area that makes things really hard. So depending on the shade of gray, if it's more black, you're going to come take a look at the mechanism of injury and then look at these Canadian CT head rules. So the Canadian CT head rules um, as they're kind of written out here, are applicable to certain age groups. 
um, they're not applicable to non-trauma related cases. So if there was no biomechanical plausible mechanism of injury, you don't use a Canadian CT head rule. Um, you, it's not for children less than 16 years old. It's not for people less than 13 on the Glasgow coma scale. It also doesn't apply for people on Coumadin, have bleeding disorders or open skull fractures. Some of those cases, the open skull fracture, Coumadin, those individuals are going to get CT scans no matter what because they're at high risk of bleeding and obviously open skull fracture. They clearly had uh, trauma to the head, a Glasgow coma score less than 13. The criterion don't apply, uh, at least the Canadian CT head rules don't apply because you're going to get a, a CT scan um, because you'll see one second that people that do get scans meet a threshold much higher than a Glasgow coma scale less than 13. And as I said, with the less than 16 year olds, they use the Picarin, which we'll cover in our pediatric version of this, uh, this recording. So individuals who are at high risk for a brain bleed and need a CT scan or individuals who have a Glasgow coma score less than 15 at two hours after injury, a suspected open or depressed skull fracture, any signs of basal skull fracture, hematopanium, raccoon eyes, CSF, otorrhea, rhinorrhea, battle sign. We're going to talk about those in a little bit too. They're at high risk and they're going to get Im imaged. Individuals who are at medium risk but will still get imaged are individuals who had amnesia before impact greater than 30 minutes and also a dangerous mechanism of injury. They're a pedestrian struck by a car. They're an occupant that was ejected from a vehicle. They fell from greater than three feet or five stairs. Uh, those are the Canadian CT head rules. So you can kind of see that most of your patients that have gotten CT scans probably should not have gotten them. So you might be saying to yourself, well, what's the harm in giving somebody a CT scan if you could prevent a brain, a brain bleed or identify a brain bleed? Well, the harm is in the research. The research shows that one CT scan increases the odds, rate, increases the odds ratio of having a brain tumor. So the reason why it doesn't apply for individuals over the age of 55 is because those individuals are old. They don't have enough time to develop a brain tumor. However, the precarian for children under 16 is a lot more strict than the Canadian CT head rule because those children have their entire life to develop these brain tumors. So CT scans are not benign. They are radiation. Uh, one CT scan is like equivalent to, I think it was like a thousand x-rays. Um, so anyways, a lot of a lot more radiation than none. So we want to use it judiciously. Now, in reality, talk to any emergency room physician, doctor, and they're going to say, you know what? With the way that society is today and all these malpractice lawsuits and these lawyers uh, trying to, to sue for malpractice, if you hit your head, you're going to get a CT scan. They would rather deal with the flip side of it saying, you know, Sick, you know, 50 years from now, somebody has a brain tumor trying to blame them for it versus them actually have a brain bleed and not detecting it. So the Canadian CT rules should be followed, but in practicality, they're not followed that often, even though they should be. Okay. So looking at the Canadian CT head rule, if you met those criteria from your biomechanical plausible mechanism of injury, the chances are you meet all of the other criterion uh, criteria for being diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. So we're going to skip from one to five, and we're going to look at the outcomes of neuroimaging. So we're on the on the left side of the screen there in those red boxes. So criterion five, it says neuroimaging abnormality, CT or MRI scans, uh, and unambiguous trauma-related intracranial abnormalities uh, if completed. So if we have those things, then you have a TBI. It's, it's pretty clear cut based upon our new preamble that says that if you have positive imaging, you cannot have a concussion, you must have a TBI. But you see the red arrow coming out of that. So if the imaging was negative after all of that, then what we're going to do is we're going to follow that red arrow straight to a concussion with negative imaging. Now let's take one step back. We said there was positive uh, or there was an abnormality of uh, in neuroimaging found, so we said that's a TBI. So how do we know if it's a mild TBI or not? Well, the mild qualifier is there only if loss of consciousness is less than 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, the Glasgow score is greater than or equal to 13. 
and also no no post traumatic amnesia greater than 24 hours. So you got to see there's a small window in there. You you have to be between th 13 and 15 on the Glasgow Coma Scale at 30 minutes, and you cannot have any loss of consciousness at 30 minutes, which makes sense because at 30 minutes, if you were unconscious, uh, your Glasgow score would be much 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 lower, maybe in you know the single digits, not the d double digits. Okay, so. Hopefully that makes sense when we go down that left pathway through the imaging route, how you can arrive at the diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, qualify it with a mild or not, and then if imaging was negative, then come through and diagnose concussion. Okay, now what if we don't have imaging? We're back at criterion one. Somebody had a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury, and then you see that the green arrows fork out into three different uh, sections. Now, one section is green, the other section is blue, just a darker blue and a lighter blue. The reason why I have it set up that way is because criterion two can exist on its own or with criterion three and four. However, criterion three has to coexist with criteria four. Okay, so you can't just have criterion three or criterion four. The way this lays out, you can have criterion two being positive and or criterion three and four. Okay, so you can have two, three, and four, all three of them, or you could just have criterion two. But if you don't have criterion two, you have to have criterion three and four. Okay, so this sometimes gets a little confusing, but I think if you just kind of listen to what I just said, it makes a lot of sense. You can have criterion two on its own. If you don't have criterion two, you have to have three and four together. Okay, so let's talk about what those are. Criterion two, clinical signs. One or more clinical sign that must be directly attributable to a brain injury. Okay, so if your big toe hurts and, you know, or, or if you've got toenail fungus, that's not a clinical sign because that's not attributable to a brain injury. So these signs must be either observed, elicited, or observable, okay? Observed is an easy one, you see it. Elicited is another easy one. You did something and you were able to elicit that from the individual and observe it. Observable is a harder one. Observable basically means that you didn't see it, you weren't there to elicit it or you couldn't elicit it, but through a historical report, you may have been able to see it or elicit it if you were there. So a great example of this is um, confusion, okay? So if you, the confusion itself is a symptom, a subjective symptom, not a sign. And confusion can be observed, but the way it is observed is through something physical. Um, somebody doesn't know what time it is or where they are or what their name is. Or you can ask them a question like, hey, what quarter is it? And they don't know. That's pretty straightforward. However, if you're not there and you know you have a patient in front of you weeks later and you're trying to see if they had any clinical signs at the time of their injury, and the only thing they can say is that I was confused, but if you said to them, you know what, um, when you were confused, did you know like what time it was or where you were? And they said no. Well, in that situation, I always tell people it's kind of like back to the future. You get in the DeLorean, go back in time. If you were there asking that question at that time, would you have been able to observe or elicit a sign? And if the answer is yes, then you can use an observable sign to meet this criteria. So I think that's a pretty good example where somebody said, you know, I was confused, didn't know where I was, what time it was, uh, or what my name was. Well, you didn't observe or elicit either one of those, but if you were there at that time, you would have been able to, okay? So those are the clinical signs. Criterion three are acute symptoms. You need two or more acute symptoms within 72 hours that are directly attributable to the brain injury. If it's a symptom that already exists in the past, such as anxiety or neck pain, it has to be new or worsened. So if your neck pain normally is a two out of six because you know the, the sports concussion assessment tool rates things on a zero to six. So if you're usually a two out of six and after uh, a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury, you're now a three, that meets the criteria even though it's not a new symptom. 
Okay, so that's symptom one. And these symptoms are very largely and grossly defined in four different categories, physical, cognitive, sleep, and emotional symptoms. And it comes with a whole host of symptoms that make up that uh, sports concussion assessment tool symptom checklist. Uh, so essentially, if you go through that checklist and you assess their symptoms within 72 hours, if they have two or more that are either new or worsened, then you're going to need criterion four to make your diagnosis. Remember, criterion four are clinical or laboratory findings, and you need one or more, more of these attributable to a brain injury. What might this look like? Well, there's cognitive, uh, cognitive of tests or findings, balance findings, oculomotor findings, symptom provocation with vestibular testing, or biomarkers indicative of intracranial injury. So those are some examples of clinical or laboratory findings. So you could do the modified balance error scoring system. You could do the VOMS. Uh, you can do the SAC, the sports assessment of, I'm sorry, standardized assessment of concussion, a cognitive test, your impact test, your C3 logics, you know, whatever it is, uh, CNS vital signs. All of these different things would indicate uh, a laboratory finding of some sort. And if it's positive, and you have the two or more symptoms, then you can move forward to criterion six. So hopefully that makes sense. If you meet criterion one, you go straight to criterion six. If you don't meet criterion, I think I said one, I meant two. If you meet criterion two, you go straight to six. If you don't meet two, you need three and four together, and then you could proceed to criterion six. And remember, criterion six basically says that other things make it nice and simple, can't account for two, three, and four. Okay, if other things don't account for two, three, and four, then you can move on to your diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, figure out was it mild, and then figure out if it was a concussion based upon that, okay? So hopefully this makes sense for you guys. Um, I think this is absolutely brilliant. I've been using it now uh, for just a little over a year, and it, I haven't gotten to a single situation where I wasn't able to come up to, uh, to with an accurate diagnosis for a patient, whether that was a patient that had a, a head injury, a brain injury, right? <laughs> head injury, right? Paper cut to the forehead is a head injury. We're talking about brain injuries here. Semantics do matter, especially when we're talking about things to patients, right? Um, but as I was saying, that this criterion has pretty much proven itself true for a year now. Um, you know, at least 50, 70 patients that I've seen in that period of time. Um, and it actually works really well. Now, there's one caveat, and some of you are already thinking of ahead. So what do we diagnose them with if they don't have both criterion three and four? What if they just have three? What if they just have four? What if they don't have two? Um, there's another diagnosis that came out of the ACRM's meeting, and that is called suspected mild TBI. The reason why it's not called suspected concussion is because we don't know if imaging would be positive or negative, and we don't know if they meet the threat criteria of a concussion. So if uh, a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury does not meet the criterion of two, three and four, or if criterion six is not met, meaning there's something else that can potentially better account for some symptoms or some signs, so you don't reach those, then you can diagnose somebody with a suspected mild traumatic brain injury. And one way I, I like to tell people to look at this, um, let's just say you have two concurrent conditions that have somewhat overlapping symptoms. Um, the flu, and oh, here, COVID and a concussion, okay? Loss of smell, can you see that in both concussion and COVID? Yes, okay? Headache, can you see that in both concussion and COVID? Yes, okay? Neck pain, concussion and COVID, yes. So that's three symptoms right now that could be accounted for by either one of them. But if you had dizziness, ringing in your ears, um, balance difficulties, those three symptoms that can't be accounted for by COVID would be the three symptoms that you use to make the criterion three. Okay, so essentially you, you say, okay, concurrent condition one accounts for these three symptoms. So I'm gonna cross them off. They can't be considered into the diagnosis, but we also have these other three that meets the criteria. And then you would diagnose that person with maybe 
COVID and a concussion, right? If they had both, okay? Hopefully that makes sense to everybody watching this. Uh, it is a little complicated, but I promise you, the more you walk through it, it's brilliant. And you should probably set up some of your intake forms uh, to reflect this. Ask these questions on your intake form. You know, At the time of your injury, did you have any loss of consciousness? Did you have any disorientation? Did you have any balance issues, muscle tone? Did you have seizures? Let them check those off, okay? In the last 72 hours, have you had any of these symptoms? Okay, and rate them, okay? And then all you have to do then at that point is you go through your checklist and when you get in the office, you're doing your laboratory testing. So a lot of this can be outsourced or offloaded to technology uh, or medical assistance, you know, physical therapy assistance, chiropractic assistance, uh, folks that can help assist you for you to do the job that you need to do, okay? Once again, a suspected NTBI, we kind of reviewed this already. They have to have it, um, if they don't have at least two symptoms, if they don't have at least um, one uh, laboratory finding, and it's unclear whether the symptoms uh, meet the criteria of the others, then you can say somebody has a suspected NTBI. When we're looking at the TBI grading to see if somebody has a mild, moderate, or severe traumatic brain injury, and I'm going to ask you a question here. Obviously, I can't hear you answer, but I want you to answer it. How do we know if somebody has a TBI? When would we be, we be using this Glasgow Coma Scale at 30 minutes? Okay, the only time you would be doing it is if they had a positive neuroimaging study. Okay, so the positive neuroimaging study, what you need at that point in time is the Glasgow Coma Scale at 30 minutes, and that'll tell you the severity of their traumatic brain injury. Pardon me. And once again, this is a repeat for before, if we're gonna apply that mild qualifier only if there's a loss of consciousness less than 30 minutes, if their Glasgow score is greater than 13, and they don't have amnesia uh, greater than 24 hours, <clears throat> okay? So once again, going through this criterion one a little bit more depth, biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury, how do we know if something is plausible, right? Uh, well. We have to look at the forces it requires to cause a concussion. And this is a really uh, sticky topic because it's really physically impossible to calculate the threshold of a concussion. Mostly because of the vectors associated with acceleration. So think of it this way. All rotational forces have components of linear forces in them, okay? Um, this is where you get your cent uh, centrifugal forces, right? So you swing something around and it, and it goes out to the side. That's a linear force being exerted on a radial moving target. So all rotational forces have translational forces in them. And anytime somebody hits their head, they're guaranteed to have both rotational and linear forces. Now the problem is depending on the rotation and the linear force, they can either couple or reduce the total amount of force associated with that. So it gets really tricky. But what we do is we kind of revert back to the literature to, with the work that other folks have done to kind of get an idea of what type of forces are associated with having a concussion. And if I just told you 82 Gs, 7.8 kilopascals, and 5,900 radians per second squared, that would mean absolutely nothing to you. So we're gonna to try to give this some context because we want you to be able to educate your patients and we want you to be educated as well too on the forces that it's required to have a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury. Because if you can't meet criterion one, then you really can't diagnose somebody with a concussion. This is important stuff, okay? And anytime you have an oblique impact, so for example, if you ran into somebody with your head on an angle, it's gonna give rise to both linear and rotational kinematics. And the brain is most sensitive to rotational motion, and that produces concussion with the, most, the greatest reproducibility, except if it's of a linear motion to the side of the head. That's shown to create um, a great reproducibility of concussion as well too. So when we look at some of those numbers in the chart, let's talk about the rows and the columns. So the columns, we have linear forces in Gs. So this is the 9.8 meters per second squared. It's the force exerted by gravity. Uh, the rotation force is listed in radians per second squared. So it's an acceleration force. And shearing stress is in kilopascals. So in the numbers you see going down the rows, 
equate to a 25% probability of having a concussion, a 50% probability, or an 80% uh, probability of having a concussion. Many uh, papers use the 100 Gs uh, as a threshold for concussion. I say a more conservative, um, probably more applicable threshold for linear forces is probably the 82 Gs or just say 80 Gs of force. Um, but the other ones don't really make any sense, right? You know, so what is a kilopascal? So at the bottom there, I kind of give you an idea. So one kilopascal is equal to 10 grams per cubic centimeter. So that means if you were to string a neuron and hold it between two posts and put something on it that weighed 10 kilograms and it had a, uh, and a surface area touching it at one square centimeter, that would equal one kilopascal. So it takes 7.8, almost eight kilopascals of force, or to say it differently, 80 grams in one cubic centimeter to create the shearing stress that would cause a concussion. That's quite a bit. And the 5,900 radians per second squared, so a radian is equal to 57 degrees um, per degrees, and we're looking at, let's just say 60 degrees, and we're looking at 6,000 uh, radians per second squared. So what's the math on that one? We're basically looking at one radian equals 57 degrees, so we have to do 6,000 times 60. Holy smokes, that's 36,000, I think, right? If I did my math right? No, 360,000. 360,000 degrees uh, per second squared of acceleration. Now that's fast, but you gotta remember that these concussions happen instantaneously, not over a second they happen over a millisecond, a thousandth of a second. Okay, so realistically, if you take 360,000 divided by a thousand, you're looking at 360 degrees per second in a millisecond. And that is that is achievable by a lot of different forces, uh, artificial forces in nature, you know, punching, hitting your head on things, things that don't happen naturally. Okay, and then 82 Gs, that's a little bit easier to understand. So, um, one G is equal to a change in velocity of 28 miles per hour per second. So this is why you get in your your Tesla uh, Roadster that goes you know zero to 60 in two seconds, and it'll pull two Gs, right? Um, so if you think about that, that Tesla zero to 60, two Gs. Well, you need 82 Gs. So you know what's the math on that one there? Like you know, I don't know. I can't even do the math on it right there. It's 36 times more, I think it is, or something like that. Um, you know, actually 41 and a half. There you go. That's better math. 41 and a half times the acceleration of your Tesla Roadster to cause a concussion, uh, if that's the case. But that remember, a concussion, a Tesla goes zero to 60 over two seconds. We're talking about something happening in a fraction of a second, a millisecond. So but that kind of gives you an idea of the forces we're talking about here. They're, they're pretty high. So what's plausible, what's not plausible? Plausible by definition is seemingly reasonable or probable. That's straight from Webster's definition. So something is either possible or not possible. So I say it differently, things are either plausible or implausible, possible or impossible. All right, it becomes very black and white. And if it's not impossible, then it has to be possible, right? So on and so forth, okay? So let's talk about this for a second. This is uh, from the literature, and I wish I had references on these. I lost my reference when I was editing this slide. I'm sorry about that. But anyways, hitting your head on an earth-fixed object at seven kilometers an hour has been shown to produce about 56 Gs of force. Okay, so that gives us that 25% probability or that 25% threshold of having a concussion. So it's completely plausible. A boxing punch from an Olympic boxer is about 58 Gs, about the same as hitting your head on an earth-fixed object at seven kilometers per hour. So you're probably saying to yourself, how is that possible? Are you getting punched by an Olympic boxer is the same as hitting your head on something? Think about the give. When you get hit in the head, your head whips back. If you hit an earth fixed object, there's no given that 100% of that force is transmitted into your brain. Okay, where in a boxing punch, because you get that acceleration and deceleration over a longer period of time, because there's no given it, um, the forces are a little bit less at the speed than they were in the earth fixed object. 
Head-to-head contact in football has been shown to get up over 98 Gs, almost to 100, plus or minus 20, so up to 130 Gs. Uh, so absolutely plausible. Now, what is not plausible to cause a concussion? In the literature, there's a reference for you. A catcher getting hit in the mask by a 60 to 80 mile per hour fastball will produce about 30 Gs of force to the head. It's still enough to rattle you for sure, um, but it's not enough to cause a concussion, not even the 25% threshold, right? Okay, so the average acceleration during a football collision is less than that, 20 Gs, plus or minus 20. So you can kind of see it. It's not really plausible for an average football collision, we're talking pad to pad, body to body, to cause a concussion. Could it cause a neck injury? Absolutely. Neck injury thresholds are closer to 3 Gs, 3 to 5 Gs, depending on how strong your neck is. But it's not likely to cause a brain injury. Um, It's not plausible. However, let's talk about subconcussive impacts. Subconcussive impacts are associated with the mean acceleration and values of 25, 26, and 22 Gs in youth, high school, and collegiate levels, respectively. Okay, so as you can kind of see, as people get better at football from high school to collegiate sports, they actually don't hit their head as hard. And the the research or that article kind of attributes it to game IQ and body position. You know, by the time you're in collegiate football, you know how to move, you know how to avoid a hit, uh, you know how to take hits, you know how to roll you know, how to fall, uh, so on and so forth. So the actual subconcussive impacts are a little bit less. Um, but we know that those subconcussive hits repetitively over a period of time can actually lead to just as much, if not more, than singular or multiple singular uh, head injuries, brain injuries alone. Um, and then, of course, you have the patients that will tell you that you know, everything that they do in their activities of daily living are causing them to get reconcussed. So this is a very empowering statement here. So there was 11 studies done in a meta-analysis looking at almost 50 activities of daily living. And what they did is they looked at head kinematics uh, from those activities of daily living. And what they found is in this, in the cohort, they never saw a person exceed 14 Gs in any of their activities of daily living. So this is why when we give people advice uh, within the first 24 to 48 hours after a concussion to engage in your activities of daily living, go for a walk, get some mild exercise, but avoid things that might cause a concussion. Well, you can tell them that going and doing your activities of daily living, you're not likely to have a concussion. And you might be as daring to say that having a football collision may not cause a concussion the first 24 to 40 hours, but what if they get hit in the head, the head-to-head contact? That's the gamble that you're looking to take there. Uh, So that's why we say, when in doubt, pull them out, keep them out, okay? And then I had a patient that uh, basically said that they they got a concussion from a roller coaster. Um, And here's a paper that came straight from the literature, and that's a PubMed reference at the end there. Even in the worst case scenario, a roller coaster will not reach the threshold of causing a concussion. Okay, so this kind of helps us with that criterion one. And this also helps us be a little bit more afraid and, and maybe supervise our kids a little bit more on the jungle gym. So 12 youths, ages 11, 8 to 11, were on a playground. None of them were injured and they had head telemetry performed. They saw that these kids, after playing on the playground, falling down, jumping around, uh, reached the thresholds of 25.7 Gs, even though that's not enough to cause a concussion it's enough to have a subconcussive impact. So kids playing on the playground every single day, 25 Gs of force is just as bad as them going out and playing football. So something to think about. Okay, so criterion two, observed, observable, elicited signs. Here, uh, we can get a lot of this out of the SCAT. So here's your SCAT six and your child SCAT six. This is the front page of them. Um, We're not gonna go through anything on the screen. Just wanted to introduce the two papers to you or two tools. The SCAT-6 is for 13 years and older in adults, and this uh, child SCAT-6 is for ages 8 to 12. A little bit different questions, a little bit different mechanism of delivery, um, but sufficient to say different enough that they made two separate tools, and you should not administer the SCAT-6 to a child or the child SCAT-6 to uh, a 13-year-old or older. So when we start looking at these 
uh, criteria, uh, the criterion two for observable, uh, elicited, or observed signs, <clears throat> there's a bunch of things that are inside the SCAT-6 that kind of tell you very straightforward what to do. Remember, the SCAT-6 is designed so that a minimally competent, trained healthcare provider can walk through this with ease and do it repetitively and uniformly uh, with another competently trained healthcare provider. This is not for neurologists, brain surgeons, experts. Um, <clears throat> it's supposed to be more uh, democratization, a tool for everybody than a tool for specific people. So athletic trainers, physical therapists, massage therapists, chiropractors, medical doctors, uh, you name it, any healthcare provider, anybody who's providing some sort of a healthcare uh, can use the SCAT-6 if they're trained to do it and it's set up to be that way. So these are the observable signs that they talk about, lying motionless, motionless on a playing surface, falling unprotected onto a surface, <clears throat> uh, balance or gait difficulties, uh, motor incoordination, ataxia, stumbling, slow labored movement, disorientation and confusion, staring, limited responsiveness, inability to respond appropriately to question, blank or vacant stare, facial injury after head trauma, impact seizures, or a high mechanism, risk mechanism of injuries that's sport dependent, right? So hitting your head on a diving board, you know, high risk mechanism. Okay, and then we have the Glasgow Coma Scale, which also needs to be administered. And the Glasgow Coma Scale, we're gonna go through it in a little bit more depth in a minute, but essentially it just talks about eye opening, verbal responses, and motor responses. And what you do is you add each one of those components together to get you your total Glasgow score. The lowest score you can get is one in each category, so one times three is three. So the lowest score on a Glasgow Coma Scale is three. And in my last concussion boot camp, we had um, a, a neurosurgeon in there and I wasn't able to answer the question why three was the lowest score. And he said, because we need to know if everything was completed. If you only scored a two, did you only do eyes and verbal? Did you not do motor response? Uh, so by knowing that there's a minimum score of three, they know that all tests were done. And that makes complete sense to me. Uh, I actually think it's pretty ingenious. Um, but the higher the score, the less brain injury, the lower the score, the greater the brain injury. And remember, this is a measurement of consciousness, okay? So a score of three would be equivalent to that of a dead person because a dead person would be completely unconscious, as would somebody that had no motor response, no verbal response, and no eye opening. Okay, so this is not necessarily a measure of vitality, it's a measurement of consciousness, okay? And then going back up to the top of the screen, you've got uh, red flags, things that you wanna make sure that you identify and call for emergency assistance or refer to a hospital or make sure you get them out of play immediately into a safe spot. Neck pain and tenderness, seizures, double vision, loss of consciousness, weakening and tingling in more than one arm or both legs, or legs, excuse me one second. <clears throat> okay, uh, weakness, uh, I'm sorry, deteriorating conscious state, vomiting. Typically we say vomiting once is okay, vomiting twice is not so good, vomiting three times is an emergency. But that's a, a generic rule of thumb. You're, nobody's going to chastise you for calling EMS if somebody's vomiting after a head injury. You, you might really be able to help somebody get care a lot quicker than necessary. But at the same time, if somebody has a vestibular contusion from a concussion, they could be dizzy nauseous and vomiting and not have any imaging uh, findings or brain bleeds, okay? Severe increasing headache, increasingly restless, agitated or combative. Typically that's the direction that people go with a brain injury. They don't get all happy and giddy. They typically go to irritability, agitative and combativeness. Um, Glasgow coma scale, less than 15, any type of visible deformity of the skull. Then of course we have to assess the cervical spine. The cervical spine is important because it's the connection between our, our head and our body, and it's a weak link. As we kind of said earlier, only three Gs of force is required to injure the neck, or you need, we said up to 80 Gs, 50, we'll say 50 plus, uh, in order to create a brain injury. So most often, it obviously depends on the mechanism of injury. Not every brain injury has to have a neck injury. I see a lot of, a lot of chiropractors, a lot of physical therapists saying, every brain injury 
has to have a neck injury because how could you injure the brain without injuring the neck if it's the weak link? Well, it really depends on the mechanism of injury, right? If you, um, if you were just, I don't know, I guess standing still with your back up against the wall and somebody punched you in the forehead and your head only moved two inches backwards, but all that force going into your brain and then hitting the wall, there wouldn't be any neck injury there, but you would certainly have a brain injury. Okay, so it really depends on the context of the injury, but we need to evaluate the cervical spine. In a patient who's not fully lucid or conscious, a cervical spine injury should be assumed and spinal precautions are taken. So always assume there's a spinal injury. Never take a helmet off of somebody, never roll them over, especially if they're unconscious and you're not able to assess whether there's integrity of the neck. So are they reporting neck pain at rest? Is there tenderness and palpation? Uh, if no tenderness in the neck or no neck pain, can they do full active range of motion? And are limb strength and sensation normal? Those are the three things you're going to want to look for. And then also step four is coordination ocular motor screening. Um, so the ocular motor proportion of this is actually new to the SCAT-6. So the coordination test is, is finger to nose test. And I want to make sure you understand this is finger to nose, not finger nose finger testing, which a lot of us do. So finger to nose test is simply just touch your nose with your finger repetitively five times, and you should be able to do that five times in three seconds. And you're supposed to be able with your eyes open and eyes closed. We're looking at that alternating movement back and forth in the accuracy, eyes open and eyes closed. Okay, the next thing is without moving their head or neck, can the patient look side to side and up and down without double vision? And while they're doing that, do you see any, any um, extraocular eye movements that are abnormal? Whether their eyes were jerky, whether their eyes started becoming esophoric or uh, hyperphorias, vertical deviations, whatever. Um, those are the things you're looking for. And if that's the case, mark it and describe it. Um, and then the last thing is you're gonna go through your Maddox questions. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions, listen carefully and tell me what you think happened. Where are we today? What happens to who scored in the last match? What team did you play when? Uh, did your team win the last game? Um, and it says sport, specific questions may be substituted, I would say should be or must be substituted because otherwise it's it's really out of context and it doesn't really hold the meaning of the Maddox questions. Okay, so just a recap, you need one of these signs, observed, elicited, or observable, can be seen by you personally, secondhand, or deduced from history. And remember, there's that whole expression with the, the Marty McFly and the time machine, would you have been able to observe the sign if you were there? If the answer is yes, it count qualifies for criterion two. There are some other things that I listed in here that weren't in the other ones, such as, such as amnesia, generalized weakness, abnormal pupillary exam, uh, abnormal eye movements, um, everything, I, slurring of speech, uh, posturing, as a lot of you guys remember, to a tago viola with the hands that went up in the air, that's posturing, abnormal motor tone. Uh, so things like that are observable signs. And when you're doing these Maddox questions, these are what we just saw a minute ago, you can modify those for those the individual situation. It doesn't necessarily, might as well go back, doesn't necessarily have to be in a game. It could be in the mall. Where are we? Okay, the Ridgedale Mall. Okay, what floor are we on? The second floor. Where are you coming from? Uh, Spencer's, okay. Where did you go before that? Okay, um, I went to Neiman Marcus, okay. What did you buy there? So these questions are can be adapted very easily to to all situations. It's it's pretty, um, and we, in the concussion boot camp we kind of talk about the formula here for Maddox questions. It's like, okay, what venue are we at today? It's just basically current spatial awareness. What half is it? Okay, it's current temporal awareness. Who scored last? So that's some abstract memory of a situation, and then. What team did you play last game? Now we're looking a little bit more remotely from a, tempor a temporal situation. And did your team win? It's contextual to that situation. So we kind of go through these a little bit more in the concussion boot camp. I don't really have enough time to cover it all in here because I told uh, people that I try to keep this under two hours and we're going to be probably at about that if I keep going. Okay, Glasgow Coma Scale. Eye opening response, verbal response, motor response. Um, I try to remember this EVM. Okay, I don't know if there's any mnemonic that you can kind of uh, think about for that, but EVM for me, I remember that way because I know EVM three four uh, four five six, EVM four five six, so I know what the scores are. 
But then once you start to do it, you just kind of know. So looking at eyes, a four would be eyes are just open. All right, they're open, they're looking around. You don't have to tell them to open their eyes. You don't have to, you know, anything like that. Or if you say their name, hey, Joe, and they open their eyes, okay, that would be considered a four. Now, the next one, a three, is you're like, hey, Joe, Joe, can you hear me? And Joe's eyes are closed. And you say, Joe, open your eyes. And Joe opens up his eyes. That would now be a three. If you tell Joe to open his eyes, but he doesn't open his eyes, and you're gonna, what you're going to try to do is elicit some pain. So what you can do is you can go to that super orbital notch right above you know, where that V1 nerve comes out, trigeminal nerve comes out. Use the tip of your finger and push pretty hard. It is painful. Okay. Typically, people will open up their eyes to that, or you can pinch their trap really hard. Right. Um, that would also typically elicit pain. If their eyes open the pain, they get a two. And after that, if they still don't open their eyes, they get a one. Okay, so verbal response, if they're oriented and they're talking to you, they get a five. If you're, they're talking to you, they're, they're able to answer questions, but they're a little bit confused in conversation and not really making a whole lot of sense. And you've, you've all seen somebody like this, whether it's after a couple cocktails or whatever, they can hold a conversation if you know that's not right. Um, that would be a four. Inappropriate responses, saying things that have no really contextual meaning to the conversation, that would be a three. Incomprehensible sounds is basically usually moaning uh, or, or growling or gurgling. That would be a two. And no verbal response at all would be a one. Okay, and for the motor response, we have six scores here. Obeys commands for movement. Can you move your hands and feet? Yep. Okay, and then what you're going to do is at that point, you're going to grab the tip of their fingernail. If they're not able to um, obey to a command, grab the tip of your fingernail with your fingernail or you can use a pen and push a pen on it and see if they pull their hand away, okay? So that's that's a purposeful movement to a painful stimulus uh, or a withdrawal from pain. If they don't have a purposeful movement to a painful stimulus, typically actually what you're gonna wanna do is do the uh, super orbital ridge with that and see if they can hit your hand away, push your hand away. That's a purposeful movement. The fingernail, if they withdraw the hand, that's a withdrawal from pain. And then the rest of them are just posturing responses. So abnormal flexion, uh, so be flexions of the upper extremities um, and typically extension of the lower extremities. That's a decorticate position. And then if they have extension, okay, I can't really do it. You can't really see me, but extension of their arms down by their side with extension of their feet. And typically they're also going to be extension of their neck. That's a decerebrate response, uh, which is a two and no motor response, just laying flaccid is a one. Okay, so you can see the permutations of these. You add them all together and you get your 13 to 15, 9 to 12, and 3 to 8. Some other signs, hematopanium, um, hemopotampanium. This is looking at uh, blood behind the eardrum. Not everybody carries around an otoscope with them, but if you have your doctor's bag and somebody takes a pretty bad blow, you're going to want to take a look at their ears and just see if they have an especially an individual who have hematopanium they're going to say a complaint of a fullness in their ear and, and difficulty hearing. Okay, so but this indicates a basal or skull fracture, and typically you're going to see this before you see uh, battle sign. Uh, we'll talk about battle sign in a second. Raccoon eyes. Uh, this is from small, shearing of capillaries underneath their eyes. Uh, it can range from mild, as seen in this picture, all the way to severe, where it looks like literally like uh, uh, raccoon eyes, like uh, Halloween makeup. Uh, really bad and usually appear one to three days after trauma, but may appear sooner and often combined with headaches and other neurological sign equals a skull fracture. Now, battles sign is not battle sign. Like a lot of people think they got in a fight. It was a battle. You know, it came from battle. No, Dr. Henry Battle discovered the sign in the 1800s. So battles possessive sign. And basically it's the name for retromastoid acamosis. Uh, or bruising behind the mastoid, behind the ear. So basically indicates a basal or skull fracture. CSF, Odo, and rhinorrhea. Um, if you see any type of fluid discharging from the ear, it's most likely CSF. There's unless they have a um, an ear infection, um, or you know they they had an ear infection, ruptured an eardrum, something like that. Those are the odd situ odd situations. But typically. If you see something coming from somebody's ears, most often CSF leaks. The more tricky ones are rhinorrhea because often when somebody has a concussion, they're crying. And when you get crying, you get a runny nose. And often 
the difference between CSF and just um, typical rhinorrhea, just nose dripping, um, is that CSF has a more salty taste, but there's also a little test that you can do. If you get a piece of paper or toilet paper or tissue and hold the tissue up and just blot the nose and collect some of the fluid that's draining and let it dry, if it doesn't dry crispy, it's CSF. If it dries crispy, it's just nasal drainage or we call them boogers, right? Okay, so that's the difference between boogers and CSF is that CSF is, when it dries, it's not crispy. All right, so the tissue paper um, will just bend freely where it was wet and dried. Okay, think about like if you put water on a um, tissue paper, it would, when it dries, it just dries. Uh, but if you blow your nose, you get a crispy tissue. Okay, so that's, um, that's the big difference. So the highest rate uh, in CSF leaks are individuals with anterior skull f fractures. And it happens in about two to three patient percent of people that have a brain injury or a head injury of some sort. Okay, so not very, very common, you know, two out of 100, um, but definitely something you should know about. Okay, criterion three, symptoms, two signs or more. This is an easy one. Um, the SCAT-6 looks at these 22 different symptoms and we rate them on a scale of zero to six. Now, if you're doing this on a baseline, you're basically going to ask a patient, uh, in general, how do you typically feel with each one of these symptoms? I want you to rate them on a scale of zero to six. Zero is none, one is mild, six is severe, the most severe. Okay, so on an, and regularly, how bad is, do you have a headache, yes or no? Okay, yes, okay, scale of one to six, and they give you your scale. And you go down the symptom checklist. Now, at the time of an injury, you're not going to say, in general, how do you feel? You're gonna say, how do you feel right now? Okay, and you're gonna collect those symptoms uh, right now. And the SCAT-6 has a nice spot for you to add up the, the mode or the reoccurrence of the symptoms or the symptom count. Uh, I guess mode's not the right answer. That's how many times something reoccurs. Uh, but the total um, symptom count. And then also add up the symptoms to, be, to, to create a total symptom burden. Okay. So here are your symptoms. Um, you guys can read them on your own, but uh, 22 different symptoms that are commonly seen with concussion. Uh, that were decided upon and agreed upon by a group of experts to be evaluated every single time for concussion. <clears throat> Laboratory findings. So if you scan this, what you're going to do is you're going to get, this QR code is going to bring you directly to the SCAT-6 official version that you can download. Basically, everything that you need for laboratory testing is included in the actual SCAT-6. Remember, this is designed to be a good screening tool, not a comprehensive analysis or a comprehensive evaluation, it's a screening tool, but it'll meet all the criteria uh, for the ACRM and the Concussion and Sports Group's definition of diagnostic criteria. So the reason and, and how we use the SCAT-6 as a standard mental screening tool uh, designed for tracking concussion and screening people for a concussion in the first five days of their injury. It begins to lose its sensitivity after 72 hours, but maintains sensitivity for up to five days. However, after 72 hours, clinicians are recommended or instructed to use what's called the SCOT-6, the Sports Concussion Office Assessment Tool, version six, okay? We're not gonna talk about the SCOT-6 here. This is acute assessment. Uh, we're gonna say after 72 hours is no longer in the uh, immediate acute phase. Uh, we're kind of getting towards that subacute phase. Um, so we're going to stick with just the SCAT-6 for this recording. It's a valid instrument, instrument. Uh, a one-point drop in the standardized assessment of concussion score can differentiate between concussed and non-concussed individual between uh, 94% specific, uh, specificity and a 76% sensitivity, and there's your reference for that. Okay, so when we're looking at the SAC or the sports concussion, uh, I'm sorry, standardized assessment of concussion, the first thing we ask about is orientation. This is executive function. What month is it? What date is it today? What day of the week is it? What year is it? What time is it right now? You just add them up. This is the same as the SCAT 5. Here's the difference though. Um, in the SCATs 1 through 5, they had a five word recall and that had a ceiling effect. And what a ceiling effect does is it reduces the sensitivity and specificity of quote unquote smart people. 
Um, and the way I ex explain this to people that seems to work really well is a ceiling effect um, basically limits how high a test can go. So let's just say that I'm in a room right now with 12 foot ceilings and I was 20 feet tall. If I stood up, I'd have to crouch down and bend over in order to fit inside this room. And if I was really upset about how tall I was, I can go to a doctor and say, make my legs shorter. And the doctor cuts five feet off of my legs. So now I'm only what? I was 20 feet, now I'm 15 feet tall. And then I go to stand up inside this room. Remember the ceiling's 12 feet tall, so when I stand up, what do I have to do? I have to still bend over. So if your metric of whether I got shorter or not was the height of the ceiling, you would not be able to detect that I lost five feet off of my body um, from that surgery. So that's what a ceiling effect does. It, it, it makes it so that individuals who would normally score high, if they become injured, you cannot detect the change because they already scored off the charts and never even got on the chart, okay? So the five word recall has been completely eliminated. It is no longer valid, no longer included in the SCAT 6. They introduced a 10 word recall in 2017, which was optional in the SCAT 5. Now it is mandatory. And what this did is eliminated a ceiling effect. And typically what we see in a, in a pretty standard population is that you get a score of about 21. All right, so you can see if they had a five word recall, five times three is 15, well, you can see that the average person scored higher than the test would measure, okay? So the patient has read the instruction, 10 words are read at a speed of one word per second, and there's an asterisk there, we'll talk about that in a second. The patient repeats back as many as they can possibly recall. This process is repeated three times with the same word being read back to them each time. Now for the SCAT 6, there's an optional 15 word list available for those scoring 10 out of 10 on the uh, immediate recall. So if somebody scores either 10 out of 10 on the first time, uh, that's when you would typically go to a 15 word, or if you did 10 out of 10 three times and you decided you wanna go to a 15 word, you could do it at that point as well too. Um, but re uh, needless to say, there is that option for 15 word list. And of course, uh, for the next concussionist support group meeting, which I think is in 2027, they're gonna be reviewing data on the 10 words and the 15 words to figure out um, if one uh, should be better than the other and one should be mandatory, okay? Sorry, just putting my watch on, do not disturb. Okay, so here's what this looks like. Here are the instructions. I'm going to test your memory. I'll read you a list of words. When I'm done, repeat them back to me, as many words as you can remember in any order. I'm not gonna go through and read these all to you uh, because this is the same as the SCAT 5, just more words. I think the important thing is just to read them at one second per word. So jacket, arrow, pepper, cotton, movie, dollar, honey, mirror, saddle, anchor, okay? You're basically reading that one word per second and you have to use these words. These words are methodically chosen. They all have two syllables. They're all very commonly used. Um, and you can kind of see that they removed penny from the primary list because not really many people use pennies anymore. Um, I don't know why arrows stuck. I don't think there's many people using arrows either, but or saddles for that matter. But you know, people know what they are. But they they did exchange the word penny because um, it's not very much is not really used anymore. Okay, so um, there you have it. That's the immediate word. So you're gonna read this list to them every single time. You're not gonna read list A, B, then C. You're gonna repeat A three times. But B and C are there for repeat trials. So if you need to do it another day uh, for serial testing, okay? Um, and you just give them a one point if they get it right, zero points if they get them wrong, and you total them up to get a total of up to 10, and then you do that for each one for the maximum score of 30. And then you do is you, you notate the time that the last trial was completed because we're gonna do a delayed memory. You don't tell the patient you're gonna do a delayed memory, but we do that delayed memory and at minimum of five minutes from now. So we wanna make sure that that time that you right now, if it's 1 p.m., you're doing the uh, delayed recall at least at 105, if not later. Okay, next we're gonna to move to attention. So you're gonna read these individuals a string of numbers and ask them to repeat them back to you in the opposite order of how you read them to them. For example, if, you said, if I said 719, you would say 917. 
If you get the correct, get the string correct, I'll provide you a longer string of numbers. If you get it wrong, you get the second chance at the same level of difficulty. So remember, we're going to stick to one list on this. So you're going to say nine, four, three, okay, one per second, and try to keep it monotone. And if the person says nine, three, four, they get it wrong, then you they get a second chance at the same level of difficulty, not the same numbers, but the same level. So you would say six to nine, and they would say nine to six, and you move on. They can get every one wrong one time. As soon as they get two wrong, meaning two, uh, two chances, that's when the test is terminated and you give them a score out of four, okay, based upon the categories they have there. Now they are talking about introducing one more digit to this. Uh, to reduce the ceiling effect. Um, not sure when that's going to be done, uh, but that was the talk, but this is the official stat six. Now, the months of the year in reverse order, there was talk about eliminating this, but what they decided to do is instead of eliminating it, now they want it timed because we believe that there's going to be some consequence of this months of the year bas backwards, which is kind of a dual tasking phenomenon and slowing, right, in, in some sort of bradyphrenia. Um, and I've seen it over and over again. I've been using C3 Logics now since 2013, uh, and they've always timed their months of the year backwards. And you can totally see people that have concussions are much slower saying the words months of the year backwards. Okay, so you're going to see how long it takes and how many errors they make. Uh, they get one point if no errors, and they complete it under 30 seconds. Okay, so that's new. Uh, before we never counted errors and we never timed it before so basically somebody can take five minutes to get the months of the year backwards and before hey you got a point um, now it's one point if no errors and completion under 30 seconds if they make an error they get zero points if it takes longer than 30 seconds they get zero points okay then the four from above combines with the one from below to give you a total of five that's your concentration score at this point in time we do the modified balance error scoring system and it's laid out this way inside the actual SCAT 6. So you just need to know how to do this. This is new to the SCAT 6. Before the, the balance error scoring system was recommended, now it is part of the SCAT 6. Okay, so these are done on a solid surface without shoes and there's three different stances, double leg, single leg, and tandem. Double leg stance, are so feet together, but I always tell people not touching. So you basically want about a hand uh, like a, a knife edge hand between each one of your feet. So this way you're not getting that proprioceptive feedback, you're not touching your ankles together, so on and so forth. And I often tell people I want to be able to slide that knife edge all the way from your heels all the way up your legs so your knees are not touching because there are some really good effective cheaters out there that squeeze their knees together for stability. Uh, that's not allowed. Okay, single leg stances on their non-dominant foot. So I often tell them, what foot do you kick a soccer ball with? And they say, my right foot. Okay, you're gonna be standing in your left foot for this one. And then putting your knee up in that position. So about 30 degrees of hip flexion and 45 degrees of knee flexion, which basically puts your big toe about uh, five inches off the floor, five to six inches off the floor. Pretty uh, generalized height, okay? Tandem stance is heel to toe with a non-dominant foot back. But I often say the same exact thing, don't let your heel touch your toe, small little space in between, decreases the proprioceptive feedback uh, and allows people not to cheat. Now the weight distribution should be evenly between those feet, not on one foot or the front foot or the back foot. And if you do the test appropriately, heel should be on the floor, toes should be on the floor. So you shouldn't really be able to shift your weight too far forward or backwards. Hands are on the iliac crest. Each test is 20 seconds, so this takes a total of one minute. The time begins once the patient is in position and closes their eyes, and you just count how many errors they make. And the maximum number of errors they can make is 10, and if they're out of position, meaning feet are not together, hands are not on the hips, um, they put their foot down, or their heel and toe comes off, you know, they have to step aside. If they're out of position for greater than five seconds, they automatically get 10 points and you can tell them to stop. So here are the errors. You get one point for lifting your hands off your iliac crest, one point for opening your eyes, one point for any step, stumble, or fall, one point for moving the hip into 30 degrees of abduction. So moving your leg laterally uh, more than 30 degrees, you get a point. But if it's just going back and forth and you're swaying side to side, there's no problem there. Just 30 degrees of uh, abduction of the hip. 
Um, also lifting the four foot or heel and placing one foot down in a single foot test. You get one point for each one of those. And if you do two things at one time, putting your foot down, taking your hands off your hips, that's equal to one point, not two, because it's simultaneous. Okay. This is a consolidated uh, slide for you to have everything on one side. So you see exactly what you're going to do there. You're going to mark which foot was tested, the testing surface, what their footwear was in case they couldn't take off um, their shoes or cleats or whatever, or if their foot was wrapped, you just kind of notate that. And then you put your scores, your balance, um, sorry, your errors for each position and total them up out of 30. Okay. And just so you know, this is basically a, a very rough, um, I guess, normative data table. You can scan that QR code and you'll get the full paper that basically stratifies it into a bazillion different categories. Athletes, non-athletes, college age, high school age, middle school, boy, girl, elderly, geriatric. I mean, all sorts of stratification. There's so much data on the balance error scoring system that they're able to take that very large uh, population of patients and stratify it really well so we can get some normative values for all these different ones. But I kind of summarized it here. So a great person is the first column. An average person is your most likely going to see poor performance is greater than six errors in the young, greater than eight errors in the middle-aged, greater than 10 errors in the older or elderly. <clears throat> okay, so once we've done the balance error scoring system, the modified balance error scoring system, um, if they performed the modified balance error scoring system well and they had uh, good, a good score on it, you're going to go to the timed tandem gate. If there was abnormalities detected in the modified balance error scoring system, the timed tandem gate, as well as a dual tasking gate, are optional. Okay, so here are your instructions uh, for the timed tandem gate. Uh, actually, I've got, I think, a better slide for this in a second. Uh, yep, it's optional, as I said, if the balance, uh, modified balance error scoring system is abnormal. So basically, if they're good, at the balance error scoring system, you have to do something else to challenge them. If they're not good at it, you've already got your data point. So the actual line is a three meter line, two inches wide or five centimeters, uh, and it's gonna be in a straight line on a floor or firm surface. Don't do it on a carpet, uh, not on a gym mat. It's gonna be on a firm surface. Uh, you're gonna use athletic tape, but I recommend, athletic tape gets a bit sticky. Gaffer's tape is incredible, it's expensive, it's probably 20, 20 to thirty dollars for a uh, a twenty five yard or fifty yard piece of a roll of tape. Um, but you know, if you're gonna do this in your clinic, you're only gonna lay the tape down one time. But the nice thing about the gaffer's tape is it pulls up without any residue. Don't use duct tape. Um, that's a bad bad day. It'll stick and you won't be able to get the the goo off the floor or whatever. So gaffer's tape, that's what we use to tape down wires and uh, to carpets and stuff like that. So you can put it on carpets, it'll pull right up, works great. Um, so the instructions for the patient is gonna be, please walk heel to toe quickly to one end of the tape, turn around to come back to me as fast as you can without separating your feet or step, stepping off the line. So you have to make sure they touch their heel to their toe and not to step off the line. You're gonna time them each time, performing three times average the times out and then record their best time for the time tandem gate. And then you're gonna to wanna to compare that against dual tasking. So the way we do the dual tasking is uh, out loud, you're gonna have them do a task. Uh, traditionally, it's reverse serial sevens, starting with double, double numbers. Don't start with, you know, seven, <laughs> obviously. Um, every other month of the year, you can say, name the US states in alphabetical order. I tell people they don't need to name every state, but you can do, Alabama, Connecticut, Colorado, Delaware, skipping states, doesn't really matter, but the fact that they're thinking about the states in alphabetic order is a dual task. Or you can name animals that begin with the letter S. All of these things are dual task. And there's also some people that call out numbers and the individual has to say whether it's odd or even because they're paying attention, thinking about whether it's odd or even. Um, you can have them, uh, you know, Name as many three-letter words as they can think of. Um, you know, the, cat, dog, hat, uh, sats, fats, you know, whatever. Any of these things are acceptable and you're going to want to pick the task that is um, applicable to the age that you're doing. Um, serial sevens is probably not going to work on an eight-year-old. 
uh, serial seven is probably not going to work on a 13 year old. Serial sevens might not work on a 20 year old. <laughs> so um, you just got to make sure that you pick the right task for it. Okay, so you're going to get them to practice it one time, time them on the practice, and then give them a different task. So you might say, okay, start with 88 minus sevens. The next time when you actually do the gate test, you're going to say, start with 81 this time. When you do every other month of the year, start with January. Next time, start with February. Okay, um, name the U.S. states in alphabetical order. Start with M. Okay, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, Nebraska. Okay, um, instead of naming animals with the letter S, you can name animals with the letter T. Okay, Tor turtle, you know, tortoise. I don't know how many animals. I can't even think of that many. Tick. I don't know. That. Whatever. So. Um, Basically, you're going to do that and time them each time, okay? And you're going to notate any errors and then do the same thing. Average the three times while they're walking on that straight line, turning around, coming back to you, uh, and notate the best score. Yeah, and that's what that, um, this is what this slide shows. And this basically explains a little bit more. So this is new to the SCAT 6. It was never included in any of the SCATs prior to the SCAT 6. So tandem gate and then dual tasking. Um, is uh, optional at this point, uh, but probably will become mandatory because you're going to see some really good data coming out of this because we've been doing this for a while and we know that dual tasking really messes up people's gates in concussion, okay? Then as long as it's been five minutes, if you've done all those things guaranteed to be more than five minutes, you're going to uh, ask them to repeat in any order the words that you read earlier to them in any order, okay? even if you said them before. Uh, I made that mistake one time um, where I didn't say, even if I said them already or if you said them already, repeat them because somebody was trying to repeat out of the 10 words what they didn't say to me. And they're like getting stumped because they got like nine out of the 10 words. They would say one word and they're like, I can't think of anything else that I didn't say already. And I was like, oh man, I read the directions wrong to you. but. Anyway, so in any order, repeat back to me as many words as you can recall from the list I read you earlier. Okay, so this is the most affected process in acute concussion. Once again, the five-word recall had a ceiling effect, so they introduced the 10-word recall um, in 2017, the SCAT 5. Now it's mandatory with the 15-word optional. And healthy individuals typically score around a 7 on this, okay, out of 10. Okay. And what's also new to the SCAT-6 are these composite scores. So you get this total cognitive score of orientation, immediate memory, concentration, delayed recall, and they add up to 50. So you basically get a cognitive score out of 50. And then you can plug that into this table that's here to the right, and then also add in your balance error scoring system, the tandem gate fastest time, and the dual task fastest time. And then you're going to have this kind of a composite table for you to make decisions off of. Um, this is new to the SCAT-6, not anything earth shattering, but the total cognitive score is definitely helpful because some people excel in some areas and are deficient in others and it helps you really understand if they're getting better or worse. Because sometimes uh, sometimes I've seen people do very poorly on the immediate word recall, very good on the delayed recall, do much um, worse I'm sorry, um, do much better on the immediate recall and do somewhat worse on the delayed recall. So it's kind of hard, oops, it's kind of hard to figure out if they got better or worse, but the composite score will help you uh, help you arrive at that conclusion. All right, we're wrapping up here um, in, in an hour and a half. We get some head injury case studies I wanna go through with you, seeing if you can apply these ACRM diagnostic criteria as well as some of the other things we learned. Um, and I'll just give you a couple seconds to think of the cases. Some of you may have already seen these cases already, but for those of you who haven't, um, they work pretty well. And for those of you who have, it's going to be a good recap. Okay, nine-year-old male hockey player recalls getting pushed in the air uh, and going into the air. The next recall he has is the coach helping him off the ice. Coach and other players observe the headfirst impact into the boards and him stumbling to get up. So right off the bat, thinking criterion one, biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury. Absolutely. Earth fixed object, he was launched in the air, hit his head, um, and that's a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury. And the next thing we want to see is criterion two do we have any signs? All right, well, let's see, stumbling to get up, gross motor instability, that's a sign. So we have at least one. 
Um, and also he lost a little bit of, of consciousness, a little bit of amnesia. amnesia. Well, I, that's a good talking point too there. Um, let me pause for a second. Amnesia versus loss of consciousness. There's no way to tell the difference between the two unless you have a second party validating that. So by definition, a loss of consciousness will have amnesia. And somebody who has amnesia won't know if they lost consciousness. So we always need a corroborative uh, witness in order to figure out if somebody lost consciousness or if they have amnesia. So you can say this is amnestic because he can't recall, but you can't tell if he lost consciousness or not. Okay, um, so we know already that we have met criterion one. If we have a biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury and we meet criterion one, then we go to criterion six to say, is there something else that can better explain this? Well, <clears throat> honestly, he could have got shocked. That's why he didn't, he was just like shocked and dis disoriented and nervous and scared and you know, adrenaline pumping that maybe caused him to not remember that period of time and stumbling to get up, he might have twisted his knee or his ankle. So we don't really know at this point. So we can't necessarily say yes to concussion, okay? So let's keep going. Acute symptoms, headache, nausea, dizziness, I'm gonna skip vomiting, blurry vision and disorientation. Those were symptoms, but vomiting times three is actually a sign and it's actually a red flag, right? Vomiting times three, we said vomiting times one is bad, vomiting times two is no good, vomiting times three, call EMS. Um, so uh, that's basically what we're dealing with here. So we have somebody that has at least two symptoms. So we have one sign, two symptoms. Could a, a, a twisted ankle, you know, knee, hip issue cause headache, nausea, dizziness, blurry vision? No. Okay, so we already have <clears throat> one sign, two symptoms. Uh, we could use a laboratory finding, but we really don't need to. But the most important thing we're dealing with right now is that he's vomiting three times. Got to call EMS. And this Glasgow score at 30 minutes was a 14, I4, verbal 4, motor 6. Okay, so EVM, uh, we know that his verbal was a little bit less than it should be. So probably his disorientation caused him to have a little bit lower score at 30 minutes. So, but because he was vomiting, and his score was less than 15, we called EMS. Um, he had a CT scan, a minor contusion was visible on his left frontal lobe. All right, this is a stopping point. A lot of you should be thinking this as well too. We have positive neuroimaging. So what can he not have? Correct, a concussion. This has to be a traumatic brain injury, okay? Um, so, Let's keep going and then we'll come back to how, what degree of mild traumatic brain injury or what degree of traumatic brain injury he has. So he had ongoing headaches two weeks later, atypically sluggish, um, King Devic test, which is a test of saccades, uh, and the Buffalo concussion treadmill test was aborted at minute six due to symptom escalation. So we have laboratory findings. So he would have had a concussion if he didn't have imaging uh, findings. But he does have imaging findings, so how do we know how severe it was? Well, we have to look at his Glasgow score at 30 minutes. And remember, moderate is 12 to eight, severe is seven or less. Uh, so basically he has a mild traumatic brain injury. So that's his diagnosis, okay? And we went through and said criterion one is met, criterion two was met, he had the signs, criterion three was met, he had multiple symptoms, criterion four was met, he had a positive lab finding, more than one, King Devic and the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test. Criterion five were met with lesioning on imaging. Uh, so that disqualifies him from a concussion and gives him a traumatic brain injury. Met the criteria for mild qualifier. So he's a mild traumatic brain injury and nothing else can better explain the scenario. So the diagnosis in this situation is mild traumatic brain injury. Okay, another one. 56-year-old female gardener. Picking up the yard, stood up and swung her head quickly, striking it on a fixed metal staircase. Okay. Biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury? Absolutely. That was actually the example that we gave in the slide earlier. Visited urgent care two days later. CT was performed. Negative. Why did they perform a CT scan? Well, they probably shouldn't have based upon her mechanism, but she might be on blood thinners that we don't know about. Um, or there may be something else that they saw that we just don't know about, 
but if this was all there was, a CT scan would not have been warranted and it's negative. So if a CT scan is not warranted, TBI is out. And if CTI scan is negative, TBI is out. So we're either gonna be dealing with a concussion, suspected concussion, or no traumatic brain injury. Okay, two weeks after injury, spotty recall of the injury event, a gap between striking her head and in the bathroom trying not to vomit. So we know she had nausea, <clears throat> and we know she has um, amnesia, right? Because there's a gap between striking her head and being in the bathroom trying not to vomit. So we have two symptoms. Does not recall sending multiple incoherent text messages uh, and talking to her sister. All right, so that's more amnesia. Walking her dog, that she didn't remember walking her dog that afternoon. Once again, more amnesia. Persistent headaches, fatigue, and cognitive symptoms. So let's stop and evaluate. We met criterion one. Do we have criterion two anywhere? Do we have any signs? Hmm. Not really, nothing that was elicited or observed because we weren't there and nobody else was there to witness. But do we have an observable sign? Well, let's think about it. If she's sending multiple incoherent texts to her sister and talking to her sister, um, maybe the sister can tell us, it, was she talking coherently or not? And the fact that she knows that she was sending incoherent texts probably means that she read it in her phone if you can get in your time machine, go back in time to that point in time you were asking your questions, do you think that you would be able to elicit some signs of confusion or incoherent speech? And the answer is yes, and that would be a sign. So we do have one sign. We have headaches, fatigue, cognitive symptoms, nausea. So we have more than four uh, acute symptoms um, at that point in time. Um, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Persistent headaches, fatigue, and cognitive symptoms were two weeks after, so those don't count because they're not within 72 hours. Here are your acute symptoms. Headache, nausea, horrific migraine, fatigue, somnolence, and difficulty thinking at next work the next day. So we have at least four symptoms. Now, criterion six comes into play. Somebody says they had a horrific migraine. Most people don't call headaches migraines unless they've had a migraine diagnosed before. So we, she may be having migraines in the situation, but with the biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury, some of the other things that she's saying, um, I would probably say that it's okay to say that criterion six is not met in the capacity that it disqualifies all of her symptoms and leads us away from the diagnosis of concussion. So diagnosis is concussion. Okay, the next one I'm not helping you on. 44-year-old male physician went out with his wife and friends to a dinner for some drinks, only had two drinks in four hours because he was a designated driver, went to his, get his car, was tapped on the shoulder, turned his head, and somebody punched him in his face. He fell to the ground but caught himself with his hands, got back up, wrestled the assailant to the ground with blood dripping down his face. Someone called the police who broke up the fight. Okay, his wife came out looking for him, and found him with the police. She reported that he was shaken up, but acting normal. EMS came and bandaged up the wound on his cheek, but he was not taken to the hospital. Okay, so we have mechanism of injury. Is it biomechanically plausible? Think about a boxer's punch. Even though this wasn't a boxer that punched him, he was turning into the punch, and he, he goes hit strong enough to knock them down to the ground. Okay, so I would say biomechanically plausible mechanism of injury is yes. Okay, let's go to number two. Does he have any signs? Okay, shaken up, that's not really a sign because and if it is a sign, it would be accounted for by getting into a, a, a fight. You know, Anybody who's ever gotten hit or attacked is gonna be shaken up. But he was acting normal, so no real signs. Blood dripping down his cheek is not the sign of a brain injury, it's a sign of a head injury, not a brain injury. And the EMS didn't take him to the hospital. So we really don't have any signs. So what does that mean? We have to be looking for criterion three and criterion four. We need both of those. We need two acute symptoms and we need one sign, one laboratory finding, excuse me. So the next day he had a headache and swelling of his face where he was punched. The headache persisted for two days. So the only headache, only sign we have so far, 
excuse me, symptom we have so far is a headache. Okay. We don't meet the two symptoms in 24 and 72 hours. Went to his PCP thinking he might have had a concussion. Examination was performed. He did not pass the balance error scoring test and his vertical saccades produced a headache. So we have two laboratory findings, but we don't meet the criterion or criteria for a concussion because we don't have two or more symptoms. All right, I said I wasn't going to help you on that one, but I did. Um, let's do the next one. No help. 30-year-old female mother driving in the rain, limited visibility. Deer suddenly appeared out of the road. She swerved, lost control of the vehicle, it hit, drove off the road, caught air off of a big hill, and hit a small tree head-on at a terminal speed of about 15 miles per hour, or 25 kilometers per hour. The tree fell over, was run over by the car, but hitting it caused the air airbags to deploy. She was terrified that her toddler was in the back seat and might be hurt. Heart racing, she tries to get out of the vehicle but cannot. But then she's like, ah, oh, I'm still seat belted. Takes off her seatbelt. Ends up calling EMS. EMS comes. Um, and I'm sorry. I'm, I don't know what I'm reading. Um, that's all we have on her. She ended up going to the hospital. Maybe from EMS. That's where I was getting them from. I don't know. Uh, 30 minutes, Glasgow scale was, was a 15, so she's completely normal on her consciousness. She's distressed, tremulous, and repeating, repeatedly inquiring if her daughter is okay. She has neck pain, stiffness, palpatory tenderness in her neck, and uh, also a generalized pressure-like moderate intensity headache. So it's going to be like one of those hat band-like headaches in the emergency room. Okay, so I want you thinking, biomechanically plausible mechanism injury, yes or no. You got to be careful there. Um, there really wasn't that big of an, an accident, right? Yeah, it sounds intense because she's catching air, hitting a small tree, but she knocked the tree over. The tree fell and was run over by the car, so there wasn't a whole lot of force transmitted to the car. Airbags are designed to deploy at five miles per hour and greater, so it did its job. If she's strapped in a seat, um, <clears throat> you know, she's not going to have a whole lot of impact on the steering wheel or the airbags. So I'll let you um, deliberate whether or not that's a blind mechanically plausible mechanism of injury, but you should also be thinking signs. Do we have any signs? Do we have any symptoms? Okay, evaluation two months after injury. Don't know why she waited so long, but she waited two months. Continuing, continuous memory lapse through events surrounding the crash. Persisting neck pain and intermittent headaches. She has reduced cervical range of motion. Her vestibular ocular motor screening was positive for symptom provocation and saccadic pursuits. By the way, the VOMS is recommended in the SCAT-6, but it's not required, okay? Recommended, but not required. But it is included in the SCOTE, right? So we haven't done the SCOTE, but we will eventually. Some brief gaps in memory during the emergency room visit before she learned of her daughter's condition. Okay, so think about this. This should give you some insight into Criterion 6, if there's something else that can better account for the condition. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds and we will move forward to the answer. No traumatic brain injury. This is whiplash associated disorder with acute stress disorder. This was a case that was actually presented at the ACRM conference uh, that I went to uh, or the um, it was a symposium on the new criteria and people were fighting this and some people said oh there's mechanism of injury there there's not mechanism of injury she has signs she doesn't have signs she has symptoms she doesn't have symptoms but the expert panel agreed that this is not a traumatic brain injury the mechanism of injury was not plausible so therefore you cannot have a concussion. You cannot have traumatic brain injury. You can even have suspected mild traumatic brain injury <clears throat> because there's no mechanism of injury that's plausible. Criterion 2 was met. She was observably confused, um, but doesn't matter. Criterion 3 was met. She had two or, plus, two or more symptoms, but those symptoms were better accounted for by whiplash in the momentary confusion and context of the intense acute stress. She did have criterion four, the oculomotor, but that could also be explained by her neck. You know, one of the things that happens with neck injuries is it messes up your oculomotor function because the central integrators 
of eye muscles share brain real estate with neck muscles, okay? So um, basically what ends up happening is because you don't have a plausible mechanism of injury, you don't really have individualized symptoms that are not better explained for by uh, whiplash associated disorder or acute stress, the diagnosis here is no traumatic brain injury. All right, oh, wrong button here. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. No, that wasn't a wrong button. That's the end of the presentation. So with that, we'll say that that is the update from the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, as well as the SCAT-6, all the changes that are there. So you can review this, watch this, play it 100 times if you want to, get caught up to date, build your examination flow, build your intake forms based upon this. But this is probably here to stay for a couple more years until the next uh, concussion and sport group meeting. And I believe that is um, scheduled to be um, in 2025, no, 2027, excuse me. Uh, so we'll see how it goes um, and we'll see what changed there. So once again, if you guys ever have any questions, you can reach out to me, mantanucci at kerrickinstitute.com. Um, and just give me a little bit of time to respond to those because I get so many emails a day. But hopefully this was helpful for you, get you updated, uh, and bridges the gap between what we taught in level one, which was the SCAT-5, based upon the 1993 ACRM diagnostic criteria, and the updates uh, to the new criteria and the SCAT-6. As you can see, there wasn't a lot to update. That's why we're able to do it in an hour and a half plus some cases. All right, everybody, we will see you soon. Thanks so much. Talk to you later.